Okay, so this is my lecture on Thompson Highway's remarkable play, Res Sisters. First, I want to say a few things about the author, Thompson Highway. Thompson Highway was born in 1951 on an island on Maria Lake in northern Manitoba. His mother was a quilt maker and his father was a trapper and dog sled racing champion. Thompson was the 11th of 12 children. At the age of six, he was sent to the Guy Hill Indian Residential School in the Paw, Manitoba. He later attended the Churchill High School in Winnipeg, where he lived in several foster homes. He received degrees in music and English at the University of Western Ontario. For seven years, he worked as a social worker primarily within Indigenous communities. Then he started writing plays. Res Sisters was first staged in November 1986. It debuted at the Native Canadian Centre in Toronto. By the end of its third week, it was selling out, with 200 people being turned away from each performance. Soon it opened in Winnipeg. By 1987, Highway had become the first Indigenous playwright to achieve mainstream success in Canada. Red Sisters was a major hit when it was performed across Canada in 1988. It was even performed at the Edinburgh International Dramatic Festival and on Broadway in New York City. In 1994, Highway received the Order of Canada. Now, Highway is an exceptional musician. His original career goal was to be a concert pianist. He writes all the songs for his plays. His last play, The Post Mistress, about a French Canadian community, is a musical. Thompson Highway is openly gay. He's been in a relationship with Raymond Lalonde, a French Canadian man, for over 35 years. And so throughout his career, Highway has been a proponent, a champion, not just of Aboriginal and Indigenous rights, but also of LBGT rights. So before we dive into the play, I also want to say a few things about the play's genre. Like Raisin in the Sun, Red Sisters is a kitchen sink drama. That is a form of realistic drama that presents domestic situations of the urban working class. Kitchen sink dramas explore controversial social and political issues involving race, class, gender, sexual orientation. A Quebec writer named Michel Tremblay brought kitchen sink drama to Canada in 1965 with his play Le Belle Sores, The Sisters-in-Law. It's a play about working class French women and it's highly critical of the Catholic Church, which was very powerful in Quebec at the time. As a result of the play, Tremblay became a major figure in the Quebec nationalist movement. Highway has said this, it's because of Tremblay that I decided to write plays. Tremblay's play made Thompson realize it was possible to write about the people he knew. As Thompson puts it, with all their problems, poverty, and gaiety. Gaiety meaning their joys. With Red Sisters, essentially what Thompson Highway is doing is taking many of the conventions of the kitchen sink drama and applying them to the social setting he knew well, that of the Native Indigenous Reserve. In this play, it's a fictional reserve, a Cree Ojibwe reserve named Washashigan Hill on Matatula Island. Well, let's turn next to the characters in this play. And I'll say a few things about Highway's approach to characterization. In many ways, it is similar to that of Lorraine Hansberry's in A Raisin in the Sun. I think you could also argue Thompson Highway is at times Shakespearean in how he handles, that is, 
dramatizes his characters for us. Highway has noted the following. He said, the Red Sisters is eight stories written simultaneously. Stories about seven women and the trickster. So I would say one of the strengths of the play is how Highway gradually introduces these characters. He set up a great challenge for himself, a play with eight protagonists. Well, as we dig into Res Sisters, we see that every character has one revelatory monologue. That's the key dramatic device that Thompson Highway uses in this play the monologue, a long speech in which we gain insight into the character's past and inner workings. Highway spreads the big speeches, the monologues, throughout the first three quarters of the play. So now let's turn to the seven female characters and focus on the big speeches with the goal of understanding Highway's approach to characterization. We'll start with the oldest Red Sister, Pelagia Patchnose, who is 53 years old. She's based on and takes her first name from Thompson Highway's own mother. In fact, near the end of the play, this is on page 117, Pelagia identifies her son in Toronto as Tom. Tom, who she complains, as she puts it, was telling me not to play so much bingo. So we works himself into the play. Pelagia's husband works 100 miles away in Espanola, which is near Sudbury. Pelagia comes across as the most level-headed and most genuinely compassionate character in the play. At one point she says she can, this is on page 59, she can handle the tired old chief and it seems like she can handle just about everybody. Well, at the same time, she's dissatisfied with her life. She yearns to get away from the reserve. She speaks the very first line in the play. So just let's turn over to page number two in our text. And there is Pelagia stating to her sister Philomena, who I'll talk about in a moment, Philomena, I want to go to Toronto. She wants to leave the reserve. A little bit deeper on page two, uh, into this lengthy speech of Pelagia's, she says, if I were superwoman, I could see the CN Tower in Toronto. Ah, but I'm just plain old Pelagia Rosella Patchnose, and I'm here in plain, dusty, boring old Washashegan Hill, waspy, waiting waiting, nailing shining shingles with my trusty silver hammer on the roof of Pelagia Rosella Patchnose's little two-bedroom welfare house. So she's saying here that her life feels too routine. And there are other reasons she wants to leave the reserve. This is in the middle of page six. She tells her sister, everyone here is crazy. No jobs, nothing to do but drink and screw each other's wives and husbands and forget about our Nana Bush. So to Pelagia, the people of the reserve are stuck in self-destructive cycles. She's angry at them for giving up on the indigenous spiritual traditions, which will figure prominently in this play. She laments all the employment and educational opportunities are found elsewhere. She feels let down by the men of the reserve, including the chief. On page seven, she says to her sister, years now the old chief's been making speeches about getting paved robes for my people, and still we got dirt road all over. Later in the play, this is on page 59, she says that she'll, pa she'll pave the roads of the reserve if they win the bingo jackpot. In fact, she has a very commonsensical plan to improve her life on the reserve. She says, again, this is on page 59, I'll tell him, I'll tell the chief, 
We'll build paved roads all over the reserve with our prize money. I'll tell them the people will stop drinking themselves to death because they'll have paved roads to walk on. I'll tell them there'll be more jobs because the people will have paved roads to drive to work on. So really she's making the case for infrastructure investment. She frequently chastises the sisters for their rude behavior, but she understands the need to accept human foibles. Later, much later in the play, on the trip to Toronto, she tells Maria Dell about a couple whose relationship was crumbling because the wife was ill. Pelagia recalls telling the ill wife, this is on page 96, middle of the page, Pelagia remembers, I said to her, you got to have faith in him and you got to have faith in life. He loves you very much, but there's only so much he can do. He's only human. This is one of the key speeches in the play because it underscores one of Thompson Highway's main messages. You have to have some degree of faith in life and in other people. Well, the next character we meet in the play is Philomena Moosetail. Philomena is Pelagia's 49-year-old sister. She wears short skirt, nylons, and high-heeled shoes, even when she's doing home repair. As her sister implies, Philomena likes to think of herself as a lady. Later on in the play, Maria Dell says Philomena looks like a giant Cupid doll. Well, Philomena's goals are much more limited than her sister's. Philomena wants to win the bingo so she can purchase, purchase a porcelain toilet bowl. In the early part of the play, we notice Philomena's gossipy and quick to take offense. In the, so in the first act, Highway does something very interesting here. He gives us this character Philomena, who is there mostly to provide comic relief. She's not given a great deal of characterization until the car trip to Toronto in Act Two. And then Highway deepens her character. He deepens her character through a monologue. And I want to turn to that monologue now. That's on page 81 of our text. In this monologue, we learn that whereas her older sister, wants to move away from the reserve. Philomena did move away years earlier, and it didn't work out. As they approach Toronto, Philomena realizes it's September 8th, and that triggers a memory. So just going to the near the top of page 81, Philomena says, Toronto, had a good job in Toronto. Yeah, had to give it all up. Yeah, because mama got sick. Philomena Margaret Moosetail, real live secretary in the Garment District. He come in and see my boss. Nice man. I thought that big red fishtail caddy. Down Queen Street, he liked me, treated me like a queen, loved me, or I thought he did. I don't know. Got pregnant anyway. Blonde, blue eyed, six foot two, and the way he smiled, God. His wife walks in on us. Long silence. He left with her long silence. I don't even know to this day if it was a boy or a girl. I'm getting old. That child would be 28. 28 years old, September 8th. You know what I'm going to do with the money if I win? I'm going to find a lawyer. Maybe I can find that child. Maybe I wouldn't even have to let him, her, know who I am. I just want to see who, and Pelagia interjects, I hope you win. So Philomena turns out to be a character haunted by her past. Perhaps she dresses the way she does to remind her of the time she was a secretary in Toronto and the object of the philandering man's lustful attention. Now she wants to set things right, but probably realizes she will never be able to do so. And thus 
she focuses on something more attainable, the porcelain toilet. Well, moving on to Maria Del Star Blanket. She's the 39-year-old half-sister of Pelagia and Philomena. Presumably, they share the same father. Maria Dell has had 14 children with her husband Eugene, to whom she's been married for about 20 years. As the play begins, Maria Dell is in the final stages of ovarian cancer. She is increasingly weak. And in fact, during the fight with Veronique in Act One, she nearly collapses. Most of the other characters are trying very hard not to acknowledge Maria Dell's condition. In Act One, she receives a letter informing her that the Monday after the big bingo game, she is scheduled for more medical exams. That's on page 55. Maria Dell doesn't seem to be in denial about her diagnosis. But as she reveals on the way to Toronto, she has one major fear. This is on page 79. She says to her sister, Annie, who we'll talk about in a moment, she says, I don't want them kids split up. You come near Eugene, she says to Annie, you start drinking, messing things up. Well, on the trip, Maria Dell makes the difficult admission that she feels estranged from her husband, likely because, as the primary caregiver, Eugene's confused as to how to respond to the ongoing trauma in their home. This is, this is on page 96. She's talking to Pelagia. And she says, I could be really mad, just raging mad, just want to tear his eyes with my nails when he walks in the door. And my whole body just goes, God, God, he doesn't talk when something goes wrong with him. He doesn't talk, shuts me out, just disappears. So as a result of the cancer, she's losing control over everything and everyone in her life. And she's having a fairly normal, that is, anguished response to her situation. Well, Maria, Maria Dell has a 36-year-old younger sister named Annie Cook. Annie is a would-be country rock singer who is probably an alcoholic. She keeps a bottle of whiskey hidden in her purse and often asks for wine. 20 years ago, she was in love with Eugene Star Blanket but he left her for Marie Adele. Annie has a grown daughter named Ellen. And during the fight at the store in Act One, Veronique suggests that Ellen is actually Eugene's daughter, though it's also mentioned that Annie has been married. Annie is immensely proud that Ellen now lives in Sudbury with a French mechanic named Raymond. In the play, Annie is smitten with a Jewish country singer named Fritz the Katz, who performs at the Silver Dollar in Toronto. Annie aspires to be, in her words, one of them Jewish princesses. Well, when Annie imagines winning the bingo, we learn more about her passion for music, specifically country music. This is on page 35, and it's among the most wonderful uh, monologues in this play. So let's just turn to page 35 and Annie's speech, Annie's monologue, which goes as follows. When I, when I go to the biggest bingo in the world in Toronto, I will win. For sure I will win. If they shout out B14 at the end, for sure I will win. The B14 is my lucky number after all. Then I will take all my money and I will go to every record store in Toronto. I will buy every single one of Patsy Cline's records, especially the one that goes, she sings, I go a-walking after midnight. Oh, I go crazy every time I hear that one. Then I will buy a huge record player, the biggest one in the whole world. And then I will go to all the taverns and all the nightclubs in Toronto and listen live 
to the live bands while I drink beer quietly, not noisy and crazy like here. I will bring my daughter, Ellen, and her white guy from Sudbury. We will sit together. Maybe I will call Fritz the Cats and he will take me out. Maybe you will hire me as one of his singers and I can, she sings, ooh, in the background when my feet go shuffling her feet from side to side. Well, Fritz the Cats is singing and the lights are flashing and the people are drinking beer and smoking cigarettes and dancing. Oh, I could dance all night with that Fritz the Cats. When I win, when I win, the biggest bingo in the world. So she says she will buy every single one of Patsy Cline's records. Patsy Cline, she was born in Westchester, Virginia in 1932 and was the top country music singer from 1957 until her death in a plane crash at age 30 in 1963. Many argue Patsy Cline was the greatest female country singer of all time. To me, there is no argument. In the speech we just went over, Annie sings a few bars of Klein's first hit, 1957's Walkin' After Midnight. Her daughter sends her a Patsy Klein record earlier in the play, and later Annie imagines Fritz singing to her Patsy Klein's biggest hit, which was written by Willie Nelson, Crazy. So Annie aspires to be the next Patsy Cline. But not only that, she identifies with the love-struck characters in Cline's songs. And so right now, I'd ask you to pause the lecture. Pause the lecture, go into the email I sent you, and listen to the two Patsy Cline songs that I've linked to in that email, Walking After Midnight and crazy. And I, I think you'll understand why Annie Cook and Timothy Drake love Patsy Cline so much. Well, then moving on to Emily Dictionary. Emily Dictionary is the 32 year old sister of Maria Dell and Annie. She's loud and crude, perhaps the most memorable character in the entire play. When she enters the stage, this is on page 37. So let's just turn to that right now. She enters the stage, middle of the page, we get a, we get, we get a, 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 a scene direction from Highway. And this is what he writes. She is one tough lady wearing cowboy boots, tight blue jeans, a black leather jacket, all three items worn to the seams, and she sports a black eye. So we learn that for 10 years, she was married to a man named Henry Danazier. The Rez sisters mispronounce his last name as Dictionary. And so that is why she is known as Emily Dictionary. She apparently had two or more children and lived in Yellowknife. She left her family and eventually joined a motorcycle gang in the Southwestern United States before ultimately returning to the reserve. When she initially appears on stage, she has a black eye. She explains she found, she explains that she found herself in the middle of a fight between Big Joey, her latest lover, and Gazelle Nadaway's Big Joey's girlfriend. Through the character of Emily, Highway addresses two issues that are important to him, domestic violence and LGBT rights. Shortly after she's introduced, Emily explains how she became a fighter. She became a, a fighter, as she puts it, uh, after, this is on page 50, let's just turn to page 50. She became a fighter, so this is in middle of page 50, after that goddamn yellow knife asshole Henry Denizier come home to me so drunk, his eyes was spitting blood like red Lucifer himself, and he beat me purple. She says to Veronique, who has told her, use your brains, Emily. Emily replies on page 51, use my brains, 
Yeah, right. I used them. I used them all right that night. That night he, her husband Henry, came at me with an axe and just about sank it into my spine. I grabbed one bag, took one last look at the kids, and walked out of his life forever. So Emily Dictionary is a victim of violence who has now become a violent person herself. Well, at the beginning of Act Two, when the Rez sisters are raising funds for their trip, Emily sings a song she says she wrote herself. This is on page 75. The song is titled, I'm Thinking of You. In its heart-wrenching simplicity, it is very much reminiscent of any number of Patsy Cline songs. Well, Emily dedicates the song to one Rosabella Baez, a Rez sister from way back. On the car trip to Toronto, this is on page 97, Emily reveals the details of her relationship with Rosabella. I think it's the best monologue in the entire play. So let's turn to page 97 in our text. And I'll go over Emily's, Emily's monologue. She says, me and the Rez sisters, she says to Maria Dell and Plagia, okay, cruising down the coast highway one night, hum of the engine between my thighs, Rose, that's Rosabella Baez, leader of the pack. We were really close, me and her. She was always thinking real deep and talking about being a woman, an Indian woman, and suicide and alcohol, and despair, and how effing hard it is to be an Indian in this country. No goddamn future for them, they'd say. And why, why, why? Always carry on like that, Christ's sakes. She was pretty heavy into drugs. Guess we all were. We had a fight. Cruising down the coast highway that night, rose in the middle, me and pussy commando off to the side. Big 18-wheeler come along real fast, and me and pussy commando get out of the way but not Rose. She stayed in the middle, went head on into that truck like a fly splat against the windshield. I swear to this day, I can still feel the spray of her blood against my neck. I drove on straight into daylight, never looked back, had enough gas money on me to take me as far as Salt Lake City, pawned my bike and bought me a bus ticket back to Wasi. When I got to Chicago, that's when I got up the nerve to wash my lover's dry blood from off my neck. I loved that woman, Maria Dell. I loved her like no man's ever loved a woman. But she's gone. I never want to go back to San Francisco. No way, man. And this, the stage direction tells us that Maria Dell comforts the crying Emily. So beneath her tough exterior, Emily Dictionary is racked by guilt, anger, and grief. So then there's Veronique St. Pierre. Veronique St. Pierre is the 45-year-old sister-in-law of all the Rez sisters. I'd say she's the least sympathetic character in this play. She's a vain, self-righteous busybody, the gossip of the reserve. A typical example of Veronique's dialogue is found on page 33. Let's just turn over to page 33. This is at the top of the page. Annie has just told him about the upcoming biggest bingo in the world. And the Rez sisters are wondering where it is. Before, before Annie can respond, Veronique says, In Toronto, soon, imagine. Gazelle's Nataway told me. She heard about it from little girl Manitouabi over in Buzza, who heard about it from her daughter, Junebug McLeod, who just got back from the hospital in Sudbury where she had her tubes tied. I just about had a heart attack. So uh, notice how Highway uses a run-on sentence to reinforce just how talkative Veronique is. Later in the play, this is on page 41, Annie warns Pelagia of Veronique's love of rumor and gossip. She says, remember, that's Veronique St. Pierre. And if you get on the wrong side of Veronique St. Pierre, she's liable to spread rumors about you all over kingdom come, and you'll lose every bit of respect you got on the reserve. 
during the big argument at the end of Act One, Maria Dell calls Veronique, this is on page 45, some kind of insect, sticking insect claws into everybody's business. So she's the reserve gossip, an unlikable person. Nevertheless, Highway creates sympathy for her, or at least allows us to understand this initially unsympathetic character. This is on page 26 of the play. On page 26, Veronique is talking to Maria Dell, and Veronique says the following, this reserve, sometimes I get sick of it. They laugh at me behind my back, I just know it. They laugh at me and Pierre St. Pierre because we don't have any children of our own. Imagine, they say, she's on her second husband already and she still can't have children. Couple lines later, she acknowledges that her husband, Pierre St. Pierre, as she puts it, never has any money. He drinks it all up. Well, Annie and Maria Dell both have long speeches about what they would do with the winnings from the bingo. It's Veronique's speech, though, that I think is the most revealing, and in, in its own twisted way, the most moving. That speech is found on page 36. So let's just turn to page 36. It begins at the bottom of that page, continues on to page 37. And it reads as follows. Well, when I win the biggest bingo of the world, no, after I win the biggest bingo in the world, I will go shopping for a brand new stove in Toronto at the Eaton Center, a great big stove, the kind Madame Benoit has, the kind that has three different compartments in the oven alone. I'll have the biggest stove on the reserve. I'll cook for all the children on the reserve. I'll adopt all of Maria Del Star Blanket's 14 children and I will cook for them. I'll even cook for Gazelle Nataway's poor starving babies when she's lolling around like a pig in Big Joey's smelly, sweaty bed. And Pierre St. Pierre can drink himself to death for all I care, because I'll be the best cook in all of Mantatulan Island. I'll enter competitions. I'll go to Paris and meet what's-his-name Cordon Bleu. I'll write a cookbook called The Joy of Veronique St. Pierre's Cooking, and it will sell in the millions, and then I will become rich and famous. Zabudigan Peterson will wear a mink while she eats steak tartare frou-frou. Madame Benoit will be so jealous, she'll suicide herself. Oh, when I win the biggest bingo in the world. So Veronique desperately wants to be important, to lord over others, but she also has a great need to care for the children she can't have herself. Which takes us to the last of the Red Sisters, and that is Veronique's 24-year-old mentally challenged daughter, Zabudigan Peterson. We learn from Veronique that Zabudigan's real name is Maria Del Peterson, and that her parents died in a car crash in 1964. Veronique brags on page 26, I'm the only one around here who is kind enough to take uh, Zabudigan in. However, Maria Dell later points out to Veronique, this is page 48, the whole reserve knows the only reason you ever adopted Zabudigan is for her disability check. Well, Zabudigan's cognitive challenges are profound. She has a limited vocabulary. At one point, she bites her own hand. And, and at another, she ties Maria Dell's shoelaces only with great difficulty. She does have one monologue. Near the end of Act One, and this is on page 47 of our text, near the end of Act One, she is suddenly able to talk, presumably thanks to the magic of Nanabush. And within the scene, it's only Nanabush who can hear her. It's the most shocking and controversial speech in the entire play. A speech that Highway has said is based on the real life 1971 kidnapping, rape, and murder 
of a 19-year-old Cree woman named Helen Beatty Osborne in Norway House, Manitoba. Zabudigan's monologue is prompted by the white feathers of the seagull. Nanabush has taken the form of a seagull. More on Nanabush later. But for now, let's turn to page 47. Near the bottom of the page, this is what Zabudigan, suddenly able to talk, says to Nanabush and says to the audience in her monologue. Are you gentle? I was not little. Maybe. Same size as now. Long ago it must be. You think I'm funny. Shh. I know who you are. There, there, boys, white boys, too. Ever nice white wings, you. I was walking down the road to the store. They asked me if I want to ride in car. Oh, I, w I was happy, I said. Yep, took me far away. Ever nice ride, dizzy. They took all my clothes off me, put something up there inside of me. Stage direction tells us, pointing to her crotch underneath her dress. Many, many times. Remember. Don't fly away. Don't go. I saw you before. There, there. It was a screwdriver. They put the screwdriver inside me. Here, remember, ever lots of blood. The two white boys left me in the bush. Alone, it was cold. Then, remember, Zabudigan. Everyone calls me Zabudigan. Why? It means needle. Zabudigan, going through thing. Needle Peterson, going through Peterson. That's me. It was the screwdriver. Nice, nice. Nikki, Ricky, Ben, Mark. The stage direction tells us as she counts with each name, feathers on the bird's wing. Ever nice, nice, white birdie, you. So many critics have argued that Highway intended the rape of Zabudigan to be a metaphor to be a metaphor for the European colonization of the Americas and the mistreatment of its people. So if we unpack this metaphor as we did when we looked at the sonnets and looked at Emily Dickinson's poetry as well as William Wordsworth's poetry, in this metaphor, the tenor would be colonization. And the vehicle for that tenor is rape. That's the metaphor. It's a very powerful speech that shocked early audiences of this play. Well, Larry Lewis, uh, Larry Lewis was the director of several Thompson Highway plays, including Res Sisters. And he has pointed out, the Res Sisters did a lot to awaken people to the fact that Indian people are living, breathing, eating cornflakes, brushing their teeth. I mean living. A lot of non-native people tend to think of native people as statues in a museum. Historical reference, sometimes in a romantic light, sometimes the drunken Indian. Whatever it is, it's a stereotype. Stereotypes don't allow for a living, breathing civilization and culture. Well, arguably, the greatest achievement of this play is exactly what Larry Lewis points out, that Thompson Highway created complex, individualized characters rather than type characters, rather than stereotypes. The fight scene at the end of Act One is excellent. I'll read a bit of that fight scene to you. This It begins on... Uh, it begins on, on page 44. Philomena begins the insults. So we're looking middle of the page, 44. Uh, Philomena says to Annie, what a slime, makes promises, and you go do something else. And I always have a, and I always have to smile at you. What slime, she turns to Emily. All that tough talk, I know what's behind it all. You're never big enough to push me around, she says to Maria Bell. 14 kids, you look like a wrinkled old prune already to Pelagia, at least I'm a woman, to Veronique. Have you an idea just how offensive, how obnoxious you are to people? And that halitosis, oh, you wouldn't have it if you didn't talk so much. Now Emily has her say, she says to Philomena, same damn bossy and pushy and sucky, you make me sick. Always wanting your own way, to Veronique, 
goddamn troublemaking old crow, to Pelagia, effing self-righteous old bitch, to Maria Dell, mental problems, that's what you got, I ain't no baby, I'm the size of an effing church, to Annie, you slippery little slut, brain the size of an effing pea, and so on. Then, then Veronique chimes in to Emily, you have no morals at all, you sick pervert, you should have stayed where you came from, where all the other perverts are, to Pelagia, you slow turtle, to talk big and move like jello, to Annie, cockroach, to Philomena, you big phony, flush yourself down that damn toilet of yours and shut up, to Maria Dell, hasn't this slimy little reptile, referring to Annie, ever told you that sweet little Ellen of hers is really Eugene's daughter? Go talk to the birds in Sudbury and find out yourself. And it goes on, Pelagia and Maria Dell and Annie all have their say in this argument. Highway holds nothing back. We see the characters at their most vitriolic, at their most petty and crude, and yet Highway asks us to care for them nonetheless. And I think it's the case that we ultimately do take up their cause. We want them to win the world's biggest bingo. Well, leaving the Red Sister characters for a moment, the seven female protagonists of this play, moving away from them, I want to turn to next this character of Nanabush. Before I do, I want to define another term that is relevant to describing the genre of Thompson Highway's play. I said earlier that this play is a kitchen sink drama, which it is. It is Thompson Highway's spin on kitchen sink drama. It's also an example of magic realism. Magic realism is fiction that combines sharply delineated realism in representing ordinary events and descriptive details together with fantastic and dreamlike elements, including materials derived from myth and fairy tale. Magic realism combines the horrible and the ludicrous, the tragic and the comic. There are many great practitioners of magic realism. Among the earliest and most influential were the British writer John Fowles, who wrote The Magus in 1965. Gab Gabriel Garcia Marquez, author of 1967, uh, 100 Years of Solitude. And of course, the great uh, uh, Anglo-British Indian writer, Salman Rushdie, who first gained fame in 1981 with his novel, Midnight Children. Neil Gaiman, one of my favorite writers, author of American Gods, Coraline, uh, the Sandman graphic novel series, very much within this tradition of magic realism. And so, in a way, is Thompson Highway. The supernatural element of Red Sisters is this character known as Nanabush, the trickster and shapeshifter from indigenous teachings. In most versions, he's half spirit, half human, sent to the people to teach them about the natural world. In some versions of the Nanabush story, he is, along with the great spirit, co-creator of the world. Nanabush is his Ojibwe name. He's also known as Raven and Coyote. We first encounter Nanabush in Highway's Red Sisters on page 18, as Marie Adele and Veronique talk with Zabudigan in the background. We get this, this stage direction, again, on page 18. Through this whole section, Highway writes, Nanabush, in the guise of a seagull, Maria Dell and Zabudigan play games with each other. Only she and Zabudigan can see the spirit inside the bird and can sort of, though not quite, recognize him for who he is. So here, in his first appearance, Nanabush is a life-affirming figure of play. 
And in fact, it was Rene Highway who performed the role of Nana Bush in the original production of Res Sisters. Rene Highway, the brother of Thompson Highway. Well, Nana Bush appears again on page 48. And this is during Zabudigan's monologue about her rape. Highway provides this stage direction. Nana Bush goes through agonizing court contortions. So Nana Bush's response to her story, I think, underscores his deep connection to Zabudigan, who despite or maybe because of her disabilities, has a deeper connection to the spirit world than most mortals. If Zabudigan's rape is a metaphor for European colonization, then perhaps Nana Bush's pain represents the spiritual damage that colonization caused. When he appears during the fundraising events, Nana Bush is a trickster, somewhat of a nuisance. On page 70, he knocks the Boudigan off her stool, making the women who can't see him laugh. And in his seagull form, he plays with Maria Dell's lines of laundry. Nana Bush appears next on page 92. And this is when the van breaks down on the highway and the women are all on the side of the road while Emily fixes the tire. Nana Bush returns this time, not as a seagull, but as a nighthawk, a figure of death. The stage direction on page 92 reads, Maria Dell begins talking to the bird almost as if she were talking to herself, quietly at first, but gradually, as the bird begins attacking her, growing more and more hysterical, until she is shrieking, flailing, and thrashing about insanely. So here, Nana Bush is a dark figure, a dark figure literally and figuratively. In this scene, Nana Bush represents and impresses upon Maria Dell the horror of death. Well, moving ahead to page 100, Nana Bush's most unexpected appearance comes at the bingo game, where he is disguised as the bingo master. The stage directions on page 100 tell us, the bingo master, the most beautiful man in the world, comes running up center aisle, cordless mic in hand, dressed to kill, tails, rhinestone, and all. He delivers this wonderfully over-the-top speech promoting the bingo game. Here, he's the comical pitchman. But the main reason for Nana Bush's presence at the bingo is soon revealed. This is moving ahead now to page 103. We have this stage direction. Out of this chaos emerges the calm, silent image of Maria Dell waltzing romantically in the arms of the bingo master. The bingo master says bingo into her ear, and the bingo master changes with sudden bird-like movements into the nighthawk, Natabush in dark feathers. What a sentence, page 103. Maria Dell beats Natabush. Turning over to page 104, we get Maria Dell's response to Nana Bush as Nana Bush as the embodiment, messenger of death. She says in Cree on page 104, Oh, it's you. So that's who you are. At rest upon the rock, the master of the game. The game, it's me. Don't be afraid. Come, come to me. Ever soft wings, beautiful soft, soft dark wings. Here, take me. The stage direction on page 104 reads, Nana Bush escorts Maria Dell into the spirit world. So Nana Bush in his Nighthawk version is frightening, but ultimately beautiful. He allows Maria Dell to accept her death. He relieves her of her pain. The soft wings, the soft wings comfort her. 
Now, the first time I read this play, I found it a bit too convenient that Marie Adele dies at the bingo game. But now, having reread the play several times, taught it a great many times, I think this plot development does work. It's a fact. People die slowly from cancer and then quickly. And Maria Dell's death enables the playgoer to understand Nana Bush and his function as providing the gateway, the gateway between life and the spirit world. Well, the last aspect of this play I want to talk about is its structure. Highway has described his approach as a dramatist the following way, and I love the way he phrases this. He says, his approach is a matter of combining classical structure with Indian street reality. Combining classical structure with Indian street reality. For this play, Thompson Highway uses a classical narrative structure, the hero's journey. And I have a book right here. It's among my favorite. The title of it is The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And it was written by a famous scholar who uh, specialized in comparative religion and comparative mythology. I believe some of his lectures are found on Netflix under the title The Power of Myth. And that scholar's name was Joseph Campbell. In 1948, he wrote this book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And in this book, he describes the hero's journey. This is what he writes. A hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered, and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons, that is, gifts, on his fellow man. And Campbell called the three stages of the hero's journey, stage one, departure, stage two, initiation, and stage three, return. And in fact, Highway incorporates each of those stages in his story. Red Sisters is, of course, about a journey. The seven women leave their home to go on a trip to Toronto. They undergo trials, that is, tests, even before they reach Toronto. First, they have to raise money for the six-hour car trip. So they hold a garage sale, a bake sale, a bottle drive, and a concert. They do window cleaning, household repairs, and laundry. On the trip itself, there are more trials. Their battered old van gets a flat tire, and this is on page 88. In the middle of the night, Maria Dell experiences uh, cancer-related spasms. Another trial for the Red Sisters they must tolerate each other in close quarters for the duration of the trip. Moreover, they must face things within themselves, traumas, fears, and much more. Departure, initiation. Well, I want to look closely at how Highway handles this third stage of the hero's journey, return. As I just quoted, in the standard hero's journey, the hero returns home transformed by his or her experience with boons, gifts for his or her people. Well, let's look at how the return stage works itself out in Highway's play. In the play's final scene, we see Annie. This is on page 107. And now, a couple weeks after their big trip to Toronto, after the funeral of Maria Del Starblanket, 
Annie is now singing backup for Fritz the Cats. She says 25 bucks a gig. Adding, that's something. Unfortunately, she's apparently still drinking. When we encounter Veronique again, she is, this is on page 110, Veronique is, the stage direction tells us, glowing with happiness. And that's because she's helping to take care of Maria Dell's now motherless 14 children. Veronique is not surprisingly quite self-righteous about her new job. On page 111, she says to Annie, I was the only person on this reserve who was willing to help these 14 little orphans. True to form, Veronique also gives Annie an unsolicited lecture about, as she puts it on page 112, you never know about these non-native barroom types. Annie and Veronique. Well, there's also Zabudigan and Emily. They have become much closer as a result of the trip. Emily stops Zabudigan from going with Nana Bush and Maria Dell. And now Emily is taking care of Zabudigan in the afternoons. And Zabudigan treats Emily with great affection. The most life-changing news is that Emily is pregnant. This is revealed on page 110. Emily is pregnant with Big Joey's child, something at this point she reveals only to Zabudigan. Becoming a mother again may make Emily more responsible. And yet, Big Joey is an abusive philanderer. So we're left unsure if, for Emily, her pregnancy is a new beginning or a cycle repeating itself. In fact, the character of Big Joey is one of the main characters in Thompson Highway's next play, written in 1988, Dry Lips Ought to Move to Capacasin. Well, the play ends as it began, with the sisters Philomena and Pelagia. Philomena, we learn, won $600 and therefore was able to buy her porcelain toilet. She has a long monologue. This is on page 117, a monologue about her new toilet. So let's just turn to that monologue. This is at the bottom of page 117. She says, large, shining, porcelain tiles, in hippity hoppity squares of black and white, so clean you can see your own face like in a mirror when you lean over to look into them. It looks so nice. The shower curtains have a certain matching blackness and whiteness to them. They're made of a rich, thick, plasticky sort of material, and they're see-through in parts. The bathtub is beautiful too, but the best, the most wonderful, my absolute most favorite part is the toilet bowl itself. First of all, it's elevated like a sort of pedestal, so that it makes you feel like the queen sitting on her royal throne, ruling her queendom with a firm yet gentle hand. And the bowl itself, white, spirit white, is of such a shape, such an exquisitely soft, perfect oval shape that it makes you want to cry. And it's so comfortable, you can just sit on it right up until the day you die. So Philomena is undeniably an eccentric. There's a lot of humor in this play, a lot of humor in this play right up to its ending. Make no mistake about it. Red Sisters is a kitchen sink drama. It incorporates elements of magic realism, and it's also a tragedy comedy. It combines tragedy with comedy. And thus it's so fitting that Nana Bush is a central figure in this play because Nana Bush in the traditions is both a figure of tragedy and comedy himself. Well, as the play wraps up, it appears that Pelagia will stay on the res after all. And she may even run for sheep. Let's just go back to page 113 and the early part of this conversation between uh, Pelagia and Philomena. 
Pelagia says, if I were chief around here, that's the first thing that I would, the first, th the very first thing that I would do is, and Philomena cuts her off, you'll never be chief. Pelagia replies, and why not, Philomena? Because you're a woman, Pelagia. Bullshit. If that useless old chief of ours was a woman, we'd see a few things get done around here. We'd see our women working. We'd see our men working. We'd see our young people sober on Saturday night, and we'd see Nanabush dancing up and down the hill on shiny black paved roads. Well, let's then turn to the final page of this play, which focuses on Pelagia. Uh, Pelagia, this is page 118 in our text, Pelagia returns to her hammering, and we get another stage direction, a marvelous stage direction that reads, Nanabush, back once more in the guise of a seagull, lands on the roof behind the unaware and unseen Pelagia. He dances to the beat of the hammer, merrily and triumphantly. So the play does end with Nana Bush's dancing. And he dances to the beat of Pelagia's hammer, which has come to be the symbol of her indomitable will. So I would say the ending of this tragic comedy, this kitchen sink drama that incorporates magic realism, the ending of Res Sisters is realistically hopeful. Highway has said this. He said this in an interview a few years ago. Here's the quotation. You know what happens when something destroys you? You pick yourself up, you brush yourself off, and you move on. This is the conclusion I've come to in the past few years. Trauma works on the same principle as manure. The more spectacular the manure, the more spectacular the flowers and the vegetables that come out of it. So there we go. That is my lecture on Thompson Highway's Red Sisters. I hope you learned from it. I hope you enjoyed it.